Okay. <laughs> Hi, guys. I know. We've, we've crammed a lot in this morning, haven't we? What do you guys remember from yesterday? What did you get out of some of the presentations yesterday? Somebody shout something out to me. The worm bins. Behind you. What about the worm bins? Sorry. Father to insect, right? What else did we get out of yesterday? Sell those worms. All right. So if you're talking now and you're in this room, kindly step out of this room because we're starting a presentation. My three biggest talkers are over here. <laughs> Jake, shut up. Yeah. I know. You guys, you guys can head outside and talk. That's fine. For the people on the live stream, if you have questions, please put the first couple words in all caps. I'll try to fit you in, but if we run out of time, we run out of time. And I wanted to remind people here that we do have the, the uh, work-in sessions starting about 5.30 today. Again, if there's a sign-up on the board, some people have already put some things up there. We have kefir grain demo, homemade Tamiflu, uh, nuclear Q&A. Near the coffee? <laughs> Near the coffee. Okay. So there's a couple there already. If you've got something you think might be a good fit for an evening session, go for it. This next session is by the, the, well, the guy that, that brought you here. So Jack Spierko is going to talk to us about what did early North Americans eat, which is on the slide behind me. You're up. Oh, we will line up for questions if there are time, but if not, we will stay on time. Go for it, Jack. All right, so straight out of the gate, this turned out to be a way different presentation than I originally planned. We're going to talk about what folks ate here a long time ago, but we're going to talk more about also when they got here, how long they were here, and we're going to discover a pattern that we think of as there was this giant civilization of Native Americans, and then we came here and it collapsed. That's not untrue. It's just that's a very binary way of looking at it. You're going to see a repeating pattern of collapse of, of cultures, of societies. Um, it's actually a really interesting story. You're going to actually hear me use the term, and then something terrible happened quite a few times today. And we are going to look at the megafauna, and that is something I wanted to let you know. I'm going to make some claims in this, and you're going to be like, ah, it's BS. And so every single thing that I have is sourced, but I'm not going to pull up an academic article and read it to you today. So you can go to the survivalpodcast.com forward slash megafauna and get the PowerPoint deck. You want that one if you want the links because the links did not stay active in the PDF. But we're going to talk about something else first. We're about midway through the event. And I think this is a good time to remind you of why we're here and how much value there is in being here. So I made this meme like last week. I actually made a different version of it and sent it to Nick Ferguson because – Something was going on. And then I said, I, I know what to do with this. I'm going to change this. Nobody does literally anything. And the government's, I want my cut. Upgrade going to get his money. All right? There are some things that you can acquire that are incredibly valuable that the government actually can't take a share of, or they take their share once, and then you get to keep it forever, and they don't repeatedly take their share. To me, one of the most valuable things that exists on this planet is knowledge and they have not yet figured out how to have an iq tax or an acquired knowledge tax and my fbi agent you totally should not write that down while you're surveilling me and and suggest that they do that they also have not come up with what's known as a relationships here are very valuable so make sure you guys are talking to each other that has nothing to do with the rest of this presentation but i just thought it was a good time to say that and i like that meme so if we're going to talk about <clears throat> What people ate, and we say the earliest North Americans, what did they eat? The first thing we have to do is figure out, well, when did it get here? So for a very long time, the conservative scientific estimation was about 15,000 years ago. They walked across the ice bridge. They showed up. And even for a very long time, people have said, I think you guys are wrong. This was known as the Clovis first specific arrowhead and spearheads that have a very distinct pattern in them and they found them in places like the east coast the west coast and they said these are the first people that got here this is the evidence well there's evidence that it's at least thirty thousand years old and again there's sources for all this stuff 
Um, some of the most impressive evidence, though, is in Uruguay, carbon dated at 30,000 years, they found mammoth bones with what they term distinctive tool marks. Now, the only thing that makes distinctive tool marks is... And they find, when they find these places, they find rocks that are used to shear and crack bone to get to the marrow, and they find rocks that are used as animals. And they found that there. And they said, well, no, we were only off by 15,000 years. And there's a whole bunch of scientists that still call all this crazy, and they say it's still about 15,000 years. Well, then they were doing some excavation, and I learned about this from two dudes you really should follow, Randall Carlson and Graham Hancock. And I think it was JR that told me about them being on Rogan, and they were just on Rogan again, and you should totally listen to that. But they were digging stuff up on a highway, and they found the same thing. And that picture right there is a mammoth femur. And you see how it's cut on a straight angle? And what the, the, the scientific community that crapped all over it said is, oh, they hit it with the excavator. Now, the guy that, that went in and authenticated this has authenticated many other similar finds, and they were okay with all his other finds until this one. That's 130,000 years, somewhere between 110 and 130, because carbon dating's ability breaks down a little bit over time. Let's call it 100,000 years. We have a massive hole in history. We know some other things, though. We do have some fossil records of what was here when we got here. Everybody's familiar with the buffalo, the bison, right? That's the little one right there. Where's my pointer? Do I got a pointer? I got a pointer. That little one there, you know how big they are, right? Did anybody see the fool get gored by one in Yellowstone? Yeah. Right? That's a standard size bison. That's bison antiquitous. That disappeared about 10,000, 11,000 years ago. Right in that range, you're going to see a lot of things just disappeared. Those are pretty big critters. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was hungry and I could find a way to eat this, I think I would figure out how to eat that. And I'd eat him too. Now, what's interesting is these guys existed at the same time. He's gone. He's not. They eat the same stuff. But they lived in different areas. That might be important in a bit. This is the North American camel. I've heard Dr. Ken talk about our horses and our camels here, and I don't think people understand scale. That's a little bit bigger than the ones that are running around in the desert today. That's a, a standard size human, six foot tall man. His head is way above the top of like the basketball, the back side of the uh, the backboard of a basketball, right? Uh, goal. This is the ground sloth. These ran around in what's today Arizona, Nevada, places like that. Now he's slow. We, can, we don't know if he's, he ate exactly the same stuff the modern sloths do, but we can look at his body and his anatomy, and they know this thing doesn't move very fast. So, again, if I'm hungry, and I got this critter, who else, you see that number again? 11,000 years. It's about how long all these things have been extinct for. But we have evidence that humans were here for at least 30,000 years and possibly 130,000 years. This is, people talk about mammoths all the time, and I don't think you understand, we know what's a mammoth. The one in the middle, that's an African elephant. Not an Indian, an African elephant. Anybody ever stand next to a full-grown male African elephant and really get the scale? There's one in the Smithsonian Institution, and that's where, you know, the only time I've ever been able to walk that close to a, a full-size elephant, and it's insane. And then they realize what this is, and this is a mastodon. So we had these guys and these guys running all around North America. Now, again, I think I'd figure out how to eat this critter. This, is, this looks like it would feed me for a while. And then we had the giant beaver. I know some of y'all. So the giant beaver weighed about 300 pounds. This is a recreation of one, and this is an actual picture, right? There's a mammoth in the background for scale. So we don't even know what these guys ate. We don't know if they actually behaved like modern beavers or not. We just know they looked like them. And again, I'm thinking I might figure out how to eat this critter. This looks, this looks pretty delicious to me. Overall, I just want to tell you that early Earth North America was lit. 
we had all these critters. You see, I showed you that sloth, right? That's the little sloth. This is the big one. That's the giant sloth. Now, he he was more into like Mexico and Central America, not kind of up around here where we're at. That's the North American lion right there. We had lions. There's the North American horse. There's a modern Roosevelt elk. That's basically an armadillo. That's some big possum on a half show. I'm thinking I would have ate some of these guys, right? The short-faced bear. It was a pretty lit place. You got these animals running all over the place, all of them extinct for between 10 and 12,000 years. But how'd they get that way? What did they tell you in school? I was taught this. This dude killed them all. This guy right here, he killed all of these things, hunted them to extinction. Well, why are the elk still here? Maybe they didn't like elk. Why are the bison still here? Maybe they just had an adaptation. They were able to survive. Who drove here instead of flew? And keep your hand up if you drove more than a couple hundred miles to get here. Thank you. Okay. When you drove here that couple hundred miles, did you drive through some areas that you would say was a whole lot of nothing? Okay. Now, we're going to go back in time to when this dude's running around with a spear and an atlatl. He's supposed to kill all these animals, him and his, his buddies, hunt them to extinction. Hmm. No roads. No wheel. That's something else we don't think about. The Native Americans did not have the wheel. We know they moved things like stones for megaliths and stuff using logs, but that never occurred to them to make an axle. Here's kind of a crazy thing about that, just as an aside. You go out to the desert southwest, they had potting wheels. Spin it with a foot, top thing spins, axle in the middle. No one ever thought, turn it sideways and make something like a wheelbarrow. So with that level of technology, and I just want you to think, any of you who have ever driven cross country, how much nothing you went through. Now take away all the roads, have some basic trail systems. Most of your movement's going to be up and down waterways because that's the easy way to move stuff. Or along the coast, really easy to navigate along the coast, isn't it? There's the water. Go that way. You want to get back, turn around, go the other way. No problem. And somehow, this guy and his friends killed all those animals. Maybe not. Maybe something terrible happened. Right about this time, period known as the Younger Dryas, science now that said the people that said this, this Graham Hancock dude, Randall Carlson, some other people, said there was probably a comet tail impact. Something hit the planet. And changed things. And it was actually two. First hit was right about the offside edge, that later, like 13,000 year, 12,500 year period. There was probably an impact. We know that the temperatures changed. It started to rapidly warm. And then it started to get cold again. And then something else happened about 1,100 years after the first one. And we got rapid warming and we've stayed. It's pretty close to the temperature we ended up there, including that whole Maunder minimum thing. Radi I mean, very small variance since that settled out. Before that second impact, there's your coastline. There's your coastline right the about the time all these guys disappeared, right? I can't even work this thing. It don't matter. You see the coastline, guys, right? How's this light work? I should have read the review on T-SPAS. <laughs> All right. Where is it? Can we work it? it takes How many people does it take to work a pointer? Right, this is the coastline. This right here, this is, this is over 300 miles between here and here. Now, where would you live if you didn't have a wheel? You didn't have a car. You didn't have a road. people live where's the vast population centers live today coasts and riverways so before this this uh happened right up here is about where pennsylvania is you know that's where jack spirko grew up the ice sheets that were this far south two miles thick two miles from the top of the ice to the, to the ground and that all melted in a few hundred to about a thousand years. That might cause a problem. That's a lot of water. And if you lived here, 
a wheel or a car or an airplane, you might just end up under the water. And if not, you would lose everything your civilization had built up to that point. And when they said, well, we can't find evidence of the civilization, if it's all under the ocean here, it's going to be hard to find after 10,000 or more years. So I don't know what happened here. Everything I'm saying today is just a guess, except for things like this, because I didn't make this, right? This is the brightest scientists in the world made this, the same ones that say I'm crazy and Graham Hancock's crazy, et cetera, and that we killed all of the megafauna. So what are, well, they ate a lot of vegetables and all, and I do think they did eat a lot of things that they farmed. I think they ate a lot of things other than meats that they harvested from the woods. This is not to make you, you know, completely go 100% Canberry carnivore, but it's to understand what their diet was like. So we, we've said they were here 30,000 years. Almost all the scientists that study this stuff agree with that number now. Many are saying this, this stuff in California looks pretty valid. could be 100,000 or more years. And how long was, were these things in cultivation? Corn evidence is about 7,300 years. Now, that corn isn't the corn that you and I see today in the store. It's not even the deer corn. This came, corn came from a plant called Seoente. And they still plant it today near their corn in Mexico because it provides genetic variations as long as they haven't let Monsanto in the house yet. But so that's the earliest ever it could be. And it wasn't everywhere because it was developed in Mexico and Central America. The potato may go back 10,000 years, but that number is only in its native range, which was in South America in the mountains. So we're, we're, nobody was eating a to potato in what's today Pennsylvania or Florida 10,000 years ago. Amaranth, superfood, right? Amaranth is superfood, the lost grain, ancient grain. 6,000 years, pretty old. Beans go back seven to 10,000 years, they're not really sure. Squash goes back about 8,000 years, but the first full domestication about four. These are your new world crops. There wasn't a whole lot else over here, right? They had tomatoes and peppers, and they were not like you buy in the store today either. They were mainly a forage thing. They didn't really farm them. What do these all have in common? Especially the beans, the amaranth, and the corn. As preppers, y'all should snap right to it. What is it about them? Long-term storage. You store long-term your survival rations, especially at this kind of time when this kind of stuff can go wrong. You got all this game running around. It's all the meat and nutrient you could want, right? So they developed the ability to do this. Everybody talks about the Three Sisters Garden. They think it's like sweet corn and your zucchini. When they did the Three Sisters Gardens, they made these huge mounds. It was basically a form of hugel culture, ancient hugel culture. They planted corn that was like a shell corn that got hard. They planted beans that dried out. And they planted squash like big ugly looking like sweet potato squash or something like that. And they planted it and they walked away and they came back after it was all dried up. All they had to do is pull it off. So it's not that they didn't use agriculture. They did a lot of agriculture. Sometimes that worked well. Sometimes it didn't because eventually somewhere in all this, whether it was 30,000 years ago or some of the stuff that we found, something terrible happened. Civilization. Civilization brings all kinds of problems with it. People start living a little bit easier. Got myself a nice house right along the city wall. You plebs are out there. We're here and protected. We're the big wigs. Got ourselves a little field to play in, do some sports. Time to think. Time to enjoy things. Put our king up on a pedestal way up here. Okay. This is a, this is a town. I can't remember the name of it now. But it was around for well over a thousand years. And this particular re recreation is from a place that was in Missouri. What's that? Uh -oh, I think that's it. And it just disappeared. Say it again. Kaokia? I'm not sure if that's right or not. But anyway, it just disappeared. No evidence of widespread warfare or anything like that. Long, this had, it was long before any of us got here just disappeared. There's another place I did a whole episode on it called Poverty Point, Louisiana. 1,200 years that, that, that civilization lasted. A little bit smaller than this one. It was about 9,000 people at its peak. Just disappeared. The more I dug into this, I thought I was just going to talk about the animals and the plants that they ate. 
the more I discovered this pattern, that these civilizations here over and over again rose, fell, left remnants. The remnants had to live a more typical tribal lifestyle and eventually recoalesced into cities and towns. When first European settlers got here, there were cities like this all over the place. We brought smallpox. We'll get to that in a second. But most of these cities were monarchies. Even if it was like the same tribe in 10 different cities, each one had a king, this dude right here. And they were not exactly great places to live if you weren't in, I guess, what you'd call their upper class. They had a lot of slaves. Now, you needed slaves because you didn't have a wheel and you needed to move stuff. They used people as pack mules. Some of the first contact with our, like, what they call conquistadors, et cetera, today, this dude here would be like, I really don't want these guys hanging around. And of course, conquistadors are in this new place and all that's going on. They're kind of hungry, and they need stuff. So King would give them some slaves and give them a bunch of food and say, hey, it's better over there. There's, that's where you really want to go. And so there were these marches throughout, specifically the southeastern United States, and within 100 years, the population cratered. We brought them a disease, smallpox. And when that happened, again, a lot of these tribes coalesced back together and began to reform. And one of the issues that we have is that we think about the Native Americans. I'm going to show you first that was. And we think about the fact that a lot of, and this will probably piss some Native Americans off, but they have this ancient tradition that goes back 10,000 years. So much of that was lost in that last catastrophe, us. That a lot of what we think of being always the way it was, handed down for 5,000 years, wasn't. When you lose everything and you have to put a small band together and rebuild from nothing, you lose a tremendous amount of your culture and your knowledge. It's, it seems impossible. Remember I said earlier about the wheel? That nobody figured out the wheel? Doesn't make a lot of sense. But they lived out on that coastline and everything got wiped out. Maybe that's where the wheel went. Maybe they never did have it. I don't know. But throughout all of this time, animals were a core part of their diet. I need to read this one because it's so long. North Americans hunted deer, antelope, bison, elk, moose, sheep, squirrel, caribou, alligator, snakes, pretty much anything that walked or crawled, but none of it into extinction. All the animals we have, they ate, never hunted them into extinction. Most tribes lived on major waterways. Fish and shellfish were a huge part of their diet. This right here, this is from Florida. This is a shell mound. That's just where all the oysters were from one place people hung out and had beach parties, I guess, right? So they ate a lot of shellfish. Hey, Ken, is there cholesterol in oysters? <laughs> a lot of it, isn't there? Yeah, they, they did pretty good. They were in, and this is the thing, they talk about how good of health they were in. Well, some were and some weren't. It all depended on, on the time and what was going on. Um, again, like I showed you earlier, most of the agricultural crops were really suited well to long-term storage. And I, I, when I said you can go get the, the copy of my presentation, there is a, one of the resources is Guts and Grease by Michael Eads, Dr. Michael Eads. I really recommend you read this article. It goes into how healthy the Native Americans were, even when they were coexisting with us during basically the formation of the United States, the colonies becoming North America, et cetera, until we put them on reservations and until we killed off the buffalo. And we took that away from them. How much taller they were on average than Europeans that were coming over here. And they had these myths that these were giants. They weren't giants. The people coming from Europe were just short. They were stunted. They were two inches shorter than they average today. Because even with garbage, at least they do get nutrition. They get some level of nutrition, some level of calories. I have a source of this image so you can get a better look at it and see more about this place. And there are thousands of these that they found because shells actually last a long time, even when you bury them. And then this is what I was talking about. They now have done a lot of research into what life was like before we got here, like right before we got here. And they found a trend 
that there was a decline in health before Columbus ever got near this place. There was an overall decline in health. Now, I don't know this, but I think if you have a rise in agricultural annual crops and high-density living, you get modern illnesses. You get modern lifestyle illnesses, and you get modern communicable diseases. We think that, oh, we brought the illnesses here. They pretty much had everything except smallpox here. And it's including STDs. They had syphilis. They had herpes. And when you put a bunch of people in a civilization living like this without plumbing, you get more problems. And when I first read this, I kind of didn't believe it. I wasn't sure about it. And then when I did the deeper research and started finding these civilizations continuously rising and falling over and over again, and the same pattern was always there, coalesce into a city and then fall apart. Some of them lasting 1,000 years or more, but it happened over and over again. By the 1700s, 1800s, Native Americans were taller again and healthier again than colonists. Well, how'd that happen? We came here, first thing we did, we spread, we, whether we did it on purpose or not, we did spread smallpox. People that don't believe that, I just don't even bother about listening to you. So their strongest ones survived. That helps. But since they lost what they had as far as a civilization, what did they all do? They basically became hunter-gatherers again. They went out and started living off the animals, and they got healthy. And then something happened again. Terrible. Smallpox. Wiped them all out. And it, yeah, this is something I, we think, again, the Native Americans. This is about 1,500, the different tribes. And I know there's no way you could read all that. Right down here in Florida, there's a tribe called Timaku. The only reason I'm familiar with them is I went to school in Florida in eighth grade. We had to learn Florida history. And that's right where I went to school, right where it says Timaku, right there in Jacksonville. And so we learned a lot about them. We went actually out and did like legitimate field trips and went out and saw how they lived and things like that. But no one's sure because they're gone. I don't mean there's not a recognized tribe or anything. I mean, there is none. There's no one that says, I go back to the Timucu now. About 100 years after the Spanish were colonizing uh, Florida, they had one of their people do a survey to find out, was there anybody that spoke Timucu? Anywhere that they could find. And they found less than 100 people even spoke the dialect and the language. Take that over all of these peoples, all of these groups. And then realize we don't know shit. We don't have a clue if that's even accurate. That's the best we can do from the records that were kept. But we have no idea what this looked like, let's say, a thousand years earlier. How many of these people rose up? from the remnants of other collapsing civilizations just due to the situation on the ground, natural catastrophes and things like that. Here's what I, I say. What do we take away from this? I want to be clear. I'm not a scientist, right? I'm not making any of the, the end here as a claim of fact. This is what I feel is most likely what we can learn from this. One, Native North Americans ate mostly meat for most of their time here. They ate all these other things. They absolutely ate chestnuts if they lived east of the Mississippi River. When you have an edible thing that actually tastes good, that just falls out of the trees, and before the chestnut blight, farmers that needed feed would take a cart and a horse and a number 10 coal shovel into the woods and shovel chestnuts. So I'm sure they ate this other stuff. But the, the biggest evidence is they lived on mostly meat, and it's probably because meat tastes good. In the words of Dennis Leary, meat tastes like murder, and murder tastes good. Agriculture led to monarchies and tyrannies, just as it did everywhere else in the world. Why would it be different here? Like, we have no qualms saying that this stuff happened in Mexico and South America, right? The Aztecs, the Incas, these empires, like, yeah, sure, all happened. Out Every place agriculture rose, tyrannies and monarchies appeared. Egypt, right? China. It always does because it makes life easy and people come together and you end up eventually with a parasite class and psychopaths are intelligent and they take over. Plant-based diets in cities led to health problems regardless of why they happened. I could be totally wrong. But the evidence that where cities rose up, health problems followed and co-aligned with agricultural crops that we think of as being healthy and nutritious 
is inevitable. Does any, I should mention the article by Dr. Eads earlier. Does anybody know who he is, Dr. Michael Eads? I know Ken does, right? He, he was one of the first low-carb people that said, yeah, you could have fat too. He was like Atkins 2.0, pre-Ken Berry, right? He wrote Protein Power Plan. He did a part of that book. It's worth buying that old book just to read The Curse of the Mummies. And what they learned when they looked at Egyptian mummies that were perfectly preserved about their health, their teeth, their bone structure. And they lived on a diet that you would consider a modern nutritionist nirvana. They ate honey and whole grain. Catastrophes cause great resets that lead back to meat and perennial-based diets. I believe that. But sooner or later, our civilization will have a massive catastrophe. We may never see it. We may live through it. It may take us out. It may not be the government. It may not be the Federal Reserve. We don't know. Things go bad. Things go wrong. This last scamdemic was a scamdemic. I'm probably banned from YouTube for another week now. But what if it hadn't been? What if it had a lethality rate of like 10%? Look at how bad everything was with just bad management. What if we get hit by another rock from outer space? What if we go in, like everybody's worried, like global warning. What if we go into an actual cooling period? How many people could survive? The reason I did this presentation for y'all today was because I wanted to do this right before lunch, and I wanted to put Ken right after lunch because we're having party day here, right? So you would eat whatever you wanted before Ken shamed you into not to do it in front of him. But I also wanted to set this up for Ken, because Ken usually talks a little bit about this as he goes into his discussion about the proper human diet. And I think this lends a lot of credibility to it. And I also really think it's very important that we don't take that explanation. Humans killed all that megafauna and just accept it. Because it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make scientific sense. It doesn't make common sense. But what it makes a case for is sometimes shit goes bad really fast and creates extinction-level events for some portion. Throughout history, if you look, there's a point where the human genome went into a very tight bottleneck. And humanity, I can't get into exactly how that works out, but humanity pretty much came close to disappearing. And it wasn't the Black Plague. It's way earlier than that. Things go wrong. That's why we prepare. And I'm telling you, I think the people that have the ability to stay healthy through this stuff have the best chance. Because I said they couldn't tax what at the beginning? Your knowledge and your relationships. You know what else they can't tax? Your health. We have this ongoing concept that we need better health care, better health care. What do they mean by that? Free health insurance for everybody. Folks, health insurance is not health care. If you want to make health care more affordable, you make healthier people and you have a better health care system. A health insurance plan that's supposed to pay for everything you have is like having an insurance plan for your car that pays for your oil changes and your gas. I would like one, but I don't think that it works. I don't think that it's reasonable, except your body's biological. You have a lot of ways, just like you can maintain your car, you can maintain your body. And I want you to think about this stuff when Ken speaks today. I can take some questions if anybody has them. Line up for questions. And if there are any online, Hatch, let me know. Absolutely. Excellent presentation. I want you guys to know that you now know more about archaeology and anthropology or paleoanthropology than the average doctor. So think about that. Because, you know, the question is, well, what's the latest nutrition research show? But no one stops to ever ask, what did humans eat 10,000 years ago? What did humans eat 100,000 years ago? What did our ancestors eat 3 million years ago? Does that sound important? But that question never gets asked at the top. All they want to know is what's the latest research out of the Harvard School of Public Health? She, she won't do it. You are, you are an ancient species of mammal. Your DNA is no different than your ancestor who lived 80,000 years ago. You have exactly the same DNA. So should your diet mimic the diet 
that made them taller than all the settlers and have better teeth, way better teeth than all the settlers? I, I say yes. Excellent presentation. Thank you, Ken. All right. Line up for questions. Jake. Oh, look, it's Jake. He's first. <laughs> So, so this clicked with me when you went through this a hypothetical or a theory that, you know, hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men. So this is kind of like playing through that on a society level through gathering up. Their cycles were much longer than we think of in the fourth turning, which you're referencing. Some of these cycles were 1,200 years, but I could see probably that there were probably micro fourth turnings. So maybe there's a macro fourth turning type of event, right? A little doomsday prepper action. I've uh, been down the uh, rabbit hole of uh, Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson for a long time. Love them. Uh, actually, this is great that you did this today because uh, Graham Hancock has a thing on Netflix coming out today called Ancient Apocalypse. I think it's a seven series thing. So the only reason why I'm not watching it is because I'm here. Seriously, guys, if you've never listened to those two gentlemen, it's 600 and something is the episode of the Joe Rogan experience that they were on together for the first time. It's three hours long, and you will not be able to stop listening to it. It will blow your mind. And what was pretty cool is there was this guy, Michael something or other, from skeptics.com or whatever, that wrote this incredible hit piece on Graham. And so Joe pulls Michael on the show with Graham and Randall and puts them in kind of a debate, then calls up Michael's boss and gets him to say, yeah, we'll retract all that shit he wrote on the website. But what was amazing is to watch Randall Carlson's mind work where he's like, hey, uh, pull up deck D, slide 111. No, that's deck C. <laughs> now, that's deck C. And he knew the slide in the deck on all his stuff. It's, it's fascinating. Okay, is there anything to the 2,000 calorie per day requirement? Is this a good Jack question or is this a Ken question? Sort of a Ken. I'll, I'll give you my opinion, though. Yeah. Ken is next. There, there is a solar. caloric requirement that we have over time that if we don't get enough food, we will die. 2,000 calories a day, in my opinion, is bullshit. And I think you're going to get the same answer from Ken. There's this thing called fasting. We don't always kill a sloth. Sometimes we might have to go three or four or five days without food. I don't know that that number for a full grown ass man like myself across time though, is even big enough. I don't completely agree with Ken that calories don't mean anything at all. I think if you manage somehow to shove 20,000 calories in your ass, it can cause a difference. But I think if, if you're eating 2000 calories a day or 4,000 calories a day on a proper human diet and you're active, you're going to be healthy. And I think 2000 for a guy my size and certainly for a guy Ken's size may not be enough. We can repeat that question when Ken's up. Any other questions from online? You have to be over here to ask. Come on down. If you want to ask questions, come here and speak to the mic, please. No. If you want to say something or ask a question, please come to me and speak into the mic or the digital audience can't hear the question and they get confused. That's why I'm doing it this way. So if anybody has a question, come on up. If you're afraid, we're not going to put the camera on you. No, no more questions. I'll I'll wrap. No, of course, him. Joe okay. Rogan six oh six. Joe Rogan six oh six. Okay, <laughs> that's not a question, but we That's get not it. a question. All right. Well, okay, thank you guys. Come, okay. Oh no, no. go Jay, ahead. Jr. Come over here so yeah. that you can ask your question without feeding back. That that first map that you showed about the shoreline, that sea level rise. Randall talked about that being like. 400 feet yeah that's the difference between that outer border and then what florida and that coastline is today like the building that we're in right now that's probably 15 feet to the apex yeah that's what we're looking at yeah for reference 400 400 feet it wiped out civilizations it had to okay. there's no way that it wouldn't it would wipe us out with all the technology we have, with all the ability to move bodies quick, with all of the ways we have to preserve food, with all of the technology we have today, this would why I would, I'm not saying there'd be nobody left. But a hundred shit. Um, 
I think that you're, you're looking at, you know, a reduction in population of something like that happened today of around 80 to 90 percent. So it doesn't even matter if you have people that know how to do things. If there's not enough bodies to get the things done, you become a tribal hunter gatherer society. And I think I, this is something I didn't say in this, but listening to Randall and, and, and Graham, Graham, oh, not Graham, Randall talks a lot about Atlantis. And I don't remember who it was back in, I think it was Plato through his own family. They had an oral tradition of the loss of Atlantis. And it dates exactly to when this shit happened. And, and, and they say they think they know where Atlantis might be. I actually don't believe Atlantis is a place. I believe Atlantis is a time that came personified by a place when this shit happened everywhere. And it certainly happened worse in some places than others. You were much worse off in the Northern Hemisphere and our part of it. Oh, on the, on the whole thing, we killed all the mammoths. Does anybody know that they had mammoths in Siberia? So I guess that dude, when he ran out of mammoths, he hauled ass back over to Siberia before the bridge went away and killed all the mammoths there too. It's, it's kind of crazy. Anybody here familiar with Galecki Tepe? Right, from Graham. And so Galecki Tepe is like the oldest megalith structure that they've ever found. It's in Turkey. And it's this. It's almost similar in some ways in shape and structure to Stonehenge without trying to fully explain it. And there's a big mystery about it because there were no civilizations until the dawn of agriculture. And this is older than that. And you don't exactly move stones like that and get things like that put together. All right. Check this freaky shit out. I think it's in a way it's Babel. When I look at how it's laid out, I could see this because they didn't do anything there. They didn't farm there. They just had all these megaliths. And I could see this as a place where people that lived out on the coast that's not here anymore would kind of migrate in and you put some guy in the middle of a circle and you put a bunch of people around them and you got everybody speaking a different language. You have a translation amphitheater. That's based on absolute nothing factual. That's just, <laughs> that's what I listened to that. That's what I thought of. Anyway. Um, I, it's, it's Goblecki Tepe. Yeah. And uh, it's dates to around the, the younger, the younger Dryas and it's in like Northern, South, southern Turkey, I think. Um, but Western Turkey. But about Randall Carlson, uh, I want to say, uh, how can we get Ken Barry to to Randall Carlson to help him lose 100 pounds in 100 days like he, like he kind of <laughs> needs to? <laughs> I'd settle for getting him on a podcast can, can together first. Can we that here? Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll pay yeah. Ken Barry's consultant fees yeah. to Randall. Uh, uh, but... There... Also about Randall's uh, thing about Atlantis is you, you know the, the sea level when it was uh, 400 feet lower, the Mid Atlantic Ridge was sticking out. Yes, as far as we as far as correct, we and there probably was a significant island nation sure. there, like the size of Britain, that probably was called Atlantis. But who knows, really? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, <clears throat> Have you ever come across the Box Saga in your? Discoveries. No. I, I'm only mentioning because I just discovered it a couple of weeks ago. And you mentioned the uh, Atlantis being a time rather than a place. Yeah. And a big part of this box saga is they say it's in the Helsinki region. It comes from Norway. And this is their uh, creation myth, creation story. And the way they say it is it's all land ice. And it refers exactly to this time period. And there was one little pocket up in up in the Scandinavian region when this younger driest period happened that didn't get covered in ice. And everywhere else did. And that's where all the megafauna died off. Everywhere else, that's why you got these giant things flash frozen because this happened real quick. Yeah. And so then these people were up there for a thousand years continuing their civilization. And then the other one happened and it thawed everything out. And so then these guys who kept their civilization for a thousand years, they came out and they were the White Walkers that came down from the north and restarted civilization all across the world. And that they were It's giants. certainly possible. And it, it, it was mind-blowing to me. It's a little bit of gravy train to go down, but yeah. it referred exactly to that, that thing. All land went to ice. So when I say it's a time land. versus a place, what I actually mean, there were many Atlantises. That's what I actually mean. And different. So then we know this thing existed, and then we look for a place where it could have been, and you go, it could have been there. Well, it probably was. All of them are Atlantises. But which ones are true, we don't know. Uh, can you do a, a further episode on all this? I'd love to hear this. It is in planning stages, yes. Anything else? All right. We're out. Nope. Looks, Bruce, did you have something? Yeah. Okay. What was the time frame for this event, this sea level rise? Is it? So the first impact that began 
a melting that never finished and it started to get cold again, the second impact looks like, because there's still debate whether there was impacts or not, about 1,100 years between the two impacts. And then if I remember right, it was just like a few hundred years before almost all the ice sheet was gone. And that sounds like a long time, but the amount and volume, and I really encourage you to look at the stuff Randall presents on the Rogan experience, like several different versions or different episodes, because he shows things like a rock face and you can basically see where water was. You can see water lines as it recedes. And then you look at it and you go, well, that's impressive. And you don't get scale. And then you zoom out and these drops are bigger than this building there's places where they show ripple effects and you look like that looks like a beach where you see the little ripples on the beach. And then he pulls back and there's a house there that looks like somebody took a sharpened number two pencil and made a dot. And that's a house. And this is in stone. It's called the Scablands. It's all up through the, the, the Northwestern United States. Now to be fair, he did say that he kind of got this whole epiphany when he was high on hallucinogenic drugs, looking over the river where he grew up in, I think it was Michigan or Wisconsin or something like that. But, I think there's a lot of truth that's found in those types of experiences. All right. Let's jazz hands for Jack. Jazz hands for Jack. So lunch is officially at 1230. They might start serving a little early before we jump into that. And we can end the live stream now. 130. Sorry, I'm an hour behind. I went back to other time. Other time. Um, what is.